thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Jessica. I'm with the Chelmsford Library, and I'm here with Kate Donovan of the Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. So tonight, I'm really excited to welcome back uh, Kate Donovan of the Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. And let's see here. Let's open this up. And then, and tonight, today, she's going to talk about herb gardening. Uh, Kate Donovan, um, it helps clients grow food through lectures, garden planning, soil testing, tilling, and building raised beds. She's the founder of a 69,000 member Facebook gardening group called Vegetable Fruit Herbs and Flower Gardening. And Kate maintains a seven extra long raised beds and considers her, her home, her horticultural, horticultural laboratory and tries new varieties and techniques every year. Uh, the mission of Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens is to inspire others to grow their fresh produce. Uh, they deliver to residential and community-based training, consulting and assistance in vegetable garden, gardening. Um, we are, they are dedicated to the belief that most people should have the knowledge and opportunity to grow wholesome fruits and veggies in containers, raised beds, or in ground gardens. Um, and then tonight, uh, she's going to talk about herb gardening, which she has going already. Um, and let's face it, store-bought herbs, either fresh or dried, can really put a strain on your wallet. So why not grow your own? If you have any questions for Kate during the presentation, please send those to the chat, and I will try to manage those after the presentation. Um, and this presentation will be recorded, so uh, I will send that out to everyone who's registered afterwards. Thank you so much, Kate, for joining us again. Thank you, thank you so much. Just just a uh, little change. Uh, now I have 10 extra large raised beds in my yard. Oh, that's so right, I forgot. No longer, no longer seven, we've graduated. That was a while ago, so. All right, let me share my screen. Oh, I, my participant sharing yeah. is, is disabled, so. Sorry about that, you should be all set now nope. oh, okay hold on one second let's check it out there we go so we're going to learn about growing our own herb gardens because herbs are good there's a lot of couple of things um i like to grow herbs because there's what an awesome way silly enough to think about but to drink more water you know you put in a little sprig of mint or a little spring of uh, spearmint or lemon balm, and it really makes your, your drinks taste better. Of course, a mojito isn't bad once in a while. And also, it certainly can liven up the most boring dish, whether it's a meatloaf and you've got some parsley and, and chives in there or all kinds of stuff, meat, veggies, you name it. So um, one thing I won't be discussing in real, real detail, because I'm not an herbalist and or a doctor, um, I won't be uh, really getting into in depth about the uh, the medicinal purpose uh, nature of herbs. Of course, you know I don't think we'd be here today. Society wouldn't have survived had it not been for herbs, because that was nature's uh, pharmacy back when. So keep that in mind as well. There are a lot of reference materials um, out there, and if you need any references to books on medicinal herbs, please. Um, make sure you send me an email and I will get that list out to you. So, okay, so what we're gonna go over is, um, you know, all my presentations are fairly uh, how-to and very practical. So that's what we're gonna go over. Some of the common annual herbs that you grow, that I grow, some perennial herbs, um, growing herbs in pots, how-to, how to grow herbs outside in the garden, and basically how to arrange your herbs. Okay. I have another class. There's another presentation out there called uh, Indoor Growing, which kind of deals with growing them indoors, but I'll explain a little bit about that as we go along. You can definitely grow herbs indoors as well. Okay. So let's talk about uh, annual and biennial herbs. An annual herb means that it has a one-year life cycle. A biennial herb is really a, a short-lived perennial, I guess you'd call it. It has a two-year life cycle. So parsley has a two-year life cycle. Note the shape of the leaf. 
It's pointed. Each leaf is pointed. Now, people don't realize that parsley has a two-year life cycle, but if you plant it outside in the garden, it'll come back again the next year. The second year it comes back, it can be huge, the size of a tomato plant. It can be woody and very bitter as well. So keep that in mind. However, because it's a biennial and has a two-year life cycle, if you're a garden nut like me and a sustainability person and you like to garden frugally, understand that you're not going to get the, the uh, seed from your parsley. You're not going to be able to harvest seed from it unless you let it work out its live out its life cycle. So you're going to have to let some grow into the second year, although it's not the tastiest in the second year, just in order to get the seed. You can still eat it. Uh, it just doesn't taste quite as good and it, and it grows huge. So combine chopped parsley with wheat, bulgar wheat, chopped greens, green onions or scallions, mint and lemon juice and olive oil. And that is a classic Middle Eastern dish called tabbouleh. Add parsley to pesto to add more texture to the color. Combine chopped parsley, garlic and lemon, lemon zest as an herb rub for your chicken, lamb, and beef. It's the most common herb used. People put it on the side of the dish and use it as a garnish. People think it's there to pretty up the dish. Actually, it neutralizes bad breath. So that's why it's used a lot with stuff like uh, that has garlic in it. I put, I have, a, uh, I have two, uh, two of my daughters, I call it, one is a 170 pound uh, English Mastiff and the other is a little mini beagle. And when I make my treats for them at, at a during the holidays, I put in uh, mint and parsley, both to help with their horrible breath that they have. So uh, it's good in soups and tomato sauces. Um, you can make a salad out of it. It's not that strong for a year. Uh, it can be used as a, a garnish for, for various uh, various foods. And as I say, note uh, the shape of the leaf. I'm going to, I say, keep that as a note because a couple of reasons, different types of parsley and they have an Italian, a, a giant Italian parsley. And uh, the, the leaf of the parsley is very similar to its cousin, which is celery. If you've ever grown celery, uh, you know, you would know it doesn't grow like the ones that you get in the store. Basically, it's it's longer and it's thinner and it's got much more uh, green and it's actually an herb. Uh, you'll see that uh, the the shape of the leaf is is quite similar, but the celery has a milder milder flavor. So, uh, so and also you'll see if you compare it to the cilantro, it's the cousin of the cilantro, completely different fla flavor profile. So, and that's what happens a lot of times you grow a bunch of stuff out in the garden, you forget what's what and what's where. You really have to look at the leaf because some of them are, so, are similar, such as parsley being similar to celery and similar to cilantro in its shape. Here it is, uh, cilantro. And you can see it looks, the leaf looks very similar to the parsley leaf, except that it's rounded on top. Cilantro is, uh, is an annual, it grows here in, in, in Massachusetts as an annual, uh, it, but it's self-seeding. I mean, I have, I have a friend of mine who has a big, big uh, garden full of cilantro, comes back every year. It doesn't come back at the root because it's not a, uh, it's not a, a perennial plant, but it's a prolific self-seeder. Some of the leaf of the, excuse me, some of the seeds of the herbs are very, very tiny. And they don't reseed, but cilantro has a little bit. Of, you can see that has a little bit of a bigger seed, and and it and it does does take if you leave it out there. Cilantro is a loves the cool weather. At the first sight of any kind of mother of all heat that comes in, it's going to say forget about it, and it's going to die on you, unfortunately. So typically, it's grown in the spring and it's grown in the fall. 
there are some varieties. Baker Creek has one that's called uh, slow bolt. So it doesn't bolt to seed quite as quickly. And there are also lemon varieties of cilantro that you may want to try. They have that, uh, Baker Creek has that as well. They don't pay me. I just, I just uh, like to, like to uh, try out interesting seed varieties. So cilantro, for some of us, there's been studies. I don't know where, where these scientists, uh, culinary people, agriculturists have the time to do all these silly studies, but there is one that, that kind of proves out what I think we've all thought in the long run is that cilantro is a terrible tasting er, uh, herb for many of us. It tastes like armpit. I mean, it's just absolutely not a pleasant flavor. And the reason for that is actually genetic. There's been a gene that's been identified that some of us has that we really don't like the taste of cilantro. Nothing we can do about it. If a recipe calls for cilantro in my world, I will switch it off to its uh, brighter, uh, milder cousin, the, the, the parsley, and I'll be fine. Um, so, but, but typically a lot of times in Mexican food, Asian food, it's mixed with other herbs as well. So kind of to tones, uh, tones down that, that flavor that we, we don't, don't like so much. So uh, cilantro pesto is used in Mediterranean uh, cuisine. Uh, red pepper, garlic, olive oil, pumpkin seeds uh, is a nice little dish. Freshly chopped and sauteed coriander leaves is great addition to a green salad. Uh, coriander seed powder, is one of the main ingredients used in the preparation of garam masala powder, which is a main staple in many uh, uh, dishes in India. So they, they like it. They, they do a lot of interesting things with herbs, the, uh, the, the Indians. So, so that's cilantro. If you like it, you go for it. The interesting thing is if you do let, if, if you do let cilantro grow, and you do keep it alive, it will produce a seed. And this seed is, is known as coriander. It's sweet and it's floral, and it has a completely different flavor profile than the leaf itself. So just because you don't like the flavor of the cilantro does not mean you won't like the flavor of the coriander, which is the seed from the cilantro. So you can start them by seed or you can buy an established plant uh, for cilantro. The seed, because it's not so, it's not one of those little tiny uh, seeds, it's not so easy to start. It's just starting it in the right season. Basil. Now basil is one of the uh, most favorite plants uh, or plants that, that people grow from our area. And when I say basil, that's a mouthful, literally, because it, believe it or not, it, basil is an annual plant, but it is, it is a little bit, it's related to the mint plant, which of course is a, is a, uh, is a perennial, but there are many, many different kinds of basil. I have, uh, I've grown uh, purple basil, lime basil, lemon basil, lettuce leaf basil, Thai basil, holy basil, uh, in the purple basil, red opal basil, the purple basil has notes of uh, cloves, it's very spicy tasting, and the uh, Thai basil has notes of anise or a licorice type of taste, so all very different. The thing in the Genovese basil is a big Italian leaf basil, you know, you know, when you go and you, and you, one of the first things I like to do in the summer, I don't know that it, I can't really say that it's summer until I have my caprese salad, which are basically the colors of the Italian flag, the green for the basil, the red for the tomato and the white for the uh, mozzarella cheese. But for that, you use a good size leaf in, and that's the Genovese basil, but there are several, several different types of basil out there. Uh, interesting, a uh, couple of interesting things about basil is uh, being one thing, as I say, a lot of them are uh, perennials and, and biennials, but perennials definitely uh, uh, 
a an annual plant. Another interesting thing about it is that uh, it's uh, fairly mild, quite versatile, and um, you know there's something for everyone. Um, the interesting thought about the lemon and the lime basil is they do have anything that you see a lot of them: so lemon flavored cilantro, lemon flavored basil, lemon lime basil. They all have that citronella chemical in them. So in theory, they're supposed to do a good job of repelling flies and mosquitoes. So interestingly enough. So um, you can make a tea uh, out of uh, uh, chopped basil leaves. Uh, you can put them in a stir fry. Uh, and you can freeze basil as well. You can also dehydrate it and save it. So. One of my favorites. So when we're talking about herbs, I like to talk about chamomile, but typically, let me just tell you this. I, I should have probably said this. The way, what an herb is, is basically the green or the leaf. It's not the fruit or basically not the seed and, and typically not the flower. So when I talk about chamomile, I shouldn't put, probably put it in this category because you basically, um, when you use chamomile in a tea, basically you, you pop the heads off and they're a little tiny flower, little tiny uh, plant uh, with a ton of little, little herbs, uh, little uh, flowers on top. You take them, you dry them and you, you uh, use them as a tea. Uh, and again, I don't, like I say, I'm not a doctor or anything, but just a few of the common reasons people take this chamomile tea. First of all, it's really, good and they say it relaxes you okay reduces inflammation has the antiseptic properties supposedly reduces migraines and aids in digestion now i can tell you that this is from the little tiny plant but it's in the daisy family daisy family has thousands of plants in it but i do know that there was one time i was taking a product over the counter product standardized uh, fever fuel, it was called. It's a type of daisy. Uh, and if I took it every day, I used to have migraines. If I took it every day and uh, it was uh, to minimize the migraines and it actually worked. So um, so if you wanna try it, but it, it makes a good tasting tea, doesn't have much of a flavor. So when you make a tea with it, it's good to add some of your mint and add some, or add some of your lemon balm or, uh, you know, uh, lemon thyme or, or some basil or something different, spice it up a little bit, but it, it's supposed to be also very relaxing. So let's talk about the dill. The dill is uh, an interesting plant. It's a fern. It's cousin to the parsley and it's cousin to the carrot. Uh, you'll actually see, sometimes if you grow dill outside, you can actually, uh, see the, uh, it get eaten and you'll, and you'll notice a little black and yellow and white striped caterpillar out there. That's, that's probably a, uh, a, a swallowtail butterfly because they, they're uh, voracious eaters of dill. Uh, these fern-like leaves of dill are aromatic and used in uh, foods such as cured, uh, cured salmon and borscht as well as other soups. Um, However, when you buy dill, you know, in the, in the grocery store, uh, if you want it, you know, like you buy those, uh, what do you call them? You buy the, the jars, you know, little, little spice jars of, of, of stuff. The dill you get, uh, the best dill is the, is the uh, freeze dry. Because when you typically dehydrate the, the dill as, as these manufacturers of these, these uh, you know, the, the ones that you buy in job lot or what have you for $1.50, um, it, it loses a lot of its flavor. So, so people, the companies tend to freeze dry them because it, uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, more flavorful that way. Dill seed has a flavor similar to caraway, but also resembling that of dried dill weed that's used as a spice. Dill oil is extracted from the leaf stems and the seeds of the plant. The oil from the seeds is distilled and used in the manufacture of soaps. Dill, of course, is the uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, is dill pickles have have dill in them. A lot of times people use it in stuff like uh, potato salad as well, uh, and they use it. Obviously, you take take the some some versions of pickles uh, use the dill. Uh, in you know, you, you take the cucumbers and put the dill in and some uh, uh, some uh, garlic and uh, other ingredients, a little bit of mustard seed or what have you. And that's basically how the, uh, the dill pickles are made. Very savory flavor. It's an acquired taste for many. So I've had the same dill uh, has, <laughs> we have the same problems with dill as with the coriander or the cilantro. It loves the cool weather. So it started, you know, I have a lot of gardeners that that start their gardens in uh, in Labor Day, uh, Memorial, excuse me, Memorial Day. That's far too late for many crops, including cilantro and dill. Those are spring herbs. You should have them out in the garden by probably April April first. So and and then start them again probably in September. So FYI. So let's talk about some uh, perennial herbs and perennial herbs can then they come back uh, year after year. So let's talk about mint. Okay, what do you do with mint? Mint is such a hardy, hardy plant. Uh, and there's different variety. There's many different varieties of mint. Uh, the, and they all hybridize. And uh, so, so what I have is called common mint. And I don't even know what that... I bought it as a plant. Mint has a very tiny seed. It's hard to, it's hard to grow from seed. I ended up buying it as a plant years ago and uh, it's still going. What happened is I, I uh, started it and I grew it in half of a, uh, half of a uh, cinder block and it kept growing and every year it would come back. It would come back full. Every single year it would come up and it started, I don't know how it was, even getting nourishment because it turned into a huge root ball, just strangling itself. So this is after like eight years, it finally started to peter out. So what I have to do is I have to remove it from that, uh, from that pot or that, uh, uh, you know, that container. And I have to literally chop it using some kind of an ax into about, you know, probably into quarters and see if I can get new growth to start because because it's so hard it's it's it strangled itself it really wants to live it really does want to live once it gets going so mint mint is mint will play the whack-a-mole game with you so you if you plant it in the ground you'll see a new mint plant come up uh next to it and then you'll see another one come up three foot just pops right out of the ground because it's actually invading uh, your garden from from underneath. It's a, it's a, a stealth type of attack, and it'll and it'll definitely deter the growth of anything else because it'll strangle it right out. So I I highly suggest that when you plant mint, you plant it in a uh, in a container. So such as a uh, they have a lot of containers nowadays. You know you can use the old fashioned uh, ceramic or the terracotta pots, or you can use one of the uh, one of the newest style. They have the uh, the resin pots. You can get them. My goodness, you can get them at Job Lot. You can get get them at Tractor Supply and get them at Home Depot. Very inexpensive, and that's where I suggest growing your mint. The seed, as I as I alluded to, the seed of the mint is very tiny, so it's very hard uh, to start it. You have to be an experienced gardener and you ha maybe have to even take, do a couple of tries. And I have a, I have a, a, a video here to show you folks on starting, starting herbs from seed that should help you out. But in order to compensate for that, mother nature gave it very, very ferocious and voracious roots. So what do you do with mint? Uh, you use it in tea, liqueur, jelly, and lamb dishes. You can certainly make a uh, put it in your mojitos. You can make an extract out of it and use it in your baking. Um, also, the true, true peppermint. 
actually has no seed. So when you see a peppermint plant, you know it's been hybridized, you know, with some other plant because it, it virtually has no seed at all. It's not, not viable at all. It, it, it only relies on, uh, you know, the uh, coming up uh, from, the, from the root, creating new plants. So they hybridize it with another type of mint uh, to, to make the seed, to keep the species going. So as you see, tend to here, a ton of different mint varieties. The ones we see here that, that you know, we may grow is there's a, there's a mint variety you see in the, in the, in the store, uh, in the you know, Home Depot or whatever, it's called chocolate mint. It doesn't taste like chocolate. It just has a brown stem to it. Also, um, you see a lot of spearmint. I have spearmint growing. Um, and spearmint is good for the breath. Like I say, I put that, I, I give that to the dogs as well. Uh, it doesn't grow quite as, uh, you know, as big and it's, it's not quite as a, uh, uh, fast growing as the common mint, but uh, give it a couple of years. And that's one thing about growing perennial herbs is, you know, the first year you might say, what's all this hubbub about? It really hasn't gotten that big. It does take a couple of years, a lot of times to, to, to really uh, take off. So, so that's it for you. Very, very hardy perennial. And just let me tell you this, you know, before we go over the other ones, just while we're talking about mint. Um, when you have a true perennial plant, the true perennial plant means that, um, that it, it, the roots keep on being viable from year to year. So what I do with my herbs, all my perennial herbs, is they get scraggly, you know, when the, when they, I leave them outside, when, when a freeze comes, they get scraggly and, and, and crummy looking on the, on the top, on the, you know, on the top of the plant. So every year I cut them right at the base and I may put some mulch over top so that they'll grow in. And every year they come back nice. They grow, they grow into a nice, like, almost like a, a rounded shape when they come up and they're absolutely beautiful, nice and healthy from the root. That's how I take care of my, uh, my perennial herbs so um oregano being as italian american that's a that's a, a big deal um you know that's your pizza pizza flavoring um it, it does lose flavor uh so you don't just you know what i do is i pick it uh dry it fairly quickly in the dehydrator and then i store it uh and that's what you use. I use for my sauce and uh, pizza, et cetera. Also add some aromatic additions to omelets and frittatas on your garlic bread and, and you add it to salad dressings as well. Or, oregano is, uh, is quite um, easy to grow. It's easy to start from seed. The thing is you'll have it for you know, like I say, I've had my mint plant for several years um, and it's still starting to peter out at this point because it outgrew its, its pot. But oregano, I tend to have three or four years and then it fizzles out, time to start a new one. But every year I do take seed from it, so. Lemon balm. Lemon balm is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and I probably give away 10 lemon balm plants every year. Let me tell you, let me tell you why. First of all, when you grow lemon balm, it's, it's, you know, it, it has uh, invasive roots. So that'll also play the whack-a-mole game, just like the mint plant. It comes up all over the place in that bed where you, where you grew it. Um, however, also, the, the seed of the lemon balm is viable. It's much bigger than the seed of the mint. So you've got it coming up via the roots, and you've also got it coming up uh, via seed spread. So the mint, as I say, the mint will invade your, your bed in, the, in that same proximity, but the lemon balm, you'll find lemon balm plants growing 
you know, over the other side of the yard, wherever the, the, uh, the wind happened to take that seed. So lemon balm is great. You put it in a, uh, uh, you know, you put it in your water, put it in your fizzy water. You can use it in baking anywhere you would, would want a nice lemon, lemon flavor. You can use it in uh, potpourri. And uh, same thing, instead of using a mint, I mean, excuse me, instead of using a lemon extract, it, you can use a lemon balm extract in your baking or what have you. And the way you make an extract is you just mix it with the vodka and let it set, you know, for a number of weeks and you'll, and it'll taste just like lemon. Very relaxing properties. If you make it into a tea and, and a lot of people mix that with the chamomile. But uh, as I say, this is something that you will definitely, definitely want to put in a, uh, in a container when you grow it. And even then you will have seed spread. So when you see seed spread, just dig it up, pot it on, put it on Facebook uh, uh, marketplace and sell them or give them away to your friends. Uh, they'll love them as well. Spread the love folks, spread the love. So that's what we're all here for. So. Okay, so lemon ball. So let's talk about sage. Sage is that thing, that flavor that they put in uh, bell seasoning, you know, that goes in the stuffing. It's a very savory flavor, almost as similar, I think anyway, as a similar profile to thyme. Sage does not, is not an invasive plant, but it is a fairly reliable perennial. I've had sage coming up for I'd say seven or eight years as well. And it in in um, yeah, it comes up every year. Like I say, it doesn't spread a whole heck of a lot. Very healthy plant. There are several varieties. I have a wonderful variety of sage that I could not find a seed for. So I ended up buying a plant. Um, it doesn't taste anything like sage, as we know it, but it was a pineapple sage, quite a lovely herb, but only we can only grow it as an annual here because it it uh, it doesn't like the cold weather. But same thing, the sage, you know, once it starts getting getting cool, if you leave it to go outside, you can, you can bring them in your herbs inside, but if you do leave it outside, what I do is I cut them all the way down to the base, uh, maybe do a little bit of fertilizing, put some mulch on there to keep the root base nice and warm. And in the spring, it comes up nice and hardy for me. So, uh, you know, in Italian cuisine, it's a central condiment for salt and boca and other dishes uh, to flavoring for fish. And it's made that sage and onion stuffing uh, mix that, that we use on Christmas and Thanksgiving, et cetera. So, so that's sage. So let's talk about, uh, this is, I think, I'm not sure what, this is how tiny the seeds can be. This is why they're not, it's not always a viable option for you to grow uh, seed, uh, herbs from seed because uh, you have to really give it a little bit of TLC. So in their best, these little tiny seeds like the mint are best grown indoors. So choose a container with some drainage or put pebbles on the bottom of the container so the excess water won't drown the seedlings. If you're starting them indoors to transplant, once the ground is warm enough, it's okay to use peat cups and then you bury the whole cup. I don't know if any of you have used peat cups, but you start the seedlings in them and they're actually made of compressed peat moss and they turn into a biodegradable material so you don't have to remove any of the plant seedlings from the cup. You just plant the whole cup and it biodegrades, it turns into a uh, compost. So um, also when you plant uh, uh, herbs or any seedling, basically you use a potting soil that's nice and light and fluffy. So the small roots can take off. Um, herb seeds can be started indoors or outdoors as long as the light is adequate. Uh, herbs love uh, lots of light, basically. For the tiny seeds, or, or pretty much any seed, you don't 
people have a tendency when they plant seeds to plant them nice and deep. Well, that doesn't always work and you won't get any herbs if you do it that way. Let me tell you why. Because when a seed is planted, um, it doesn't really need any nutri nutrients in order to germinate. It's actually living off its own husk. That husk, the hard part of the seed is actually breaking down and uh, turning to fertilizer and allows the seed to break through the soil. So therefore, and if you take a little tiny seed like that and plant it deep, it's going to run out of steam before it actually reaches the air and, and gets a chance to have any light. So it'll just die. So for plants, uh, for herbs, what I do basically, regardless whether I start them inside under light or directly outside, is I did just pat them gently with your hand so they have some good soil uh, to seed contact. And then maybe dust a little bit of uh, soil on top and water it in good. So, and then water with the fine mist sprayer. Uh, you don't want to pour water over it because if you pour water over it, you're going to dislodge the seed from the soil, which is what you're trying to avoid. So when we talk about growing stuff, growing flowers, growing herbs, growing veggies, whatever it is, uh, herbs are probably the most difficult to start from seed because of because they're so small. Well, I shouldn't say that. They're not hard. Just just remember not to plant them too deeply. Follow the instructions; they're just as easy. But we have a high failure rate of people starting them because they tend to plant them. Uh, you know, they you know plant them too too deeply. So, so I'm I have a little video. Let me show you this. Um, this lady knows her stuff, so let's see. I'm Donna Emery with Glover Nursery in West Jordan, Utah. We're gonna to talk today about planting seeds for a home herb garden. We're in the greenhouse planting herb seeds for a home herb garden. I've selected a lightweight seedling and cutting mix. You can make your own from vermiculite and peat light, about 50-50, but it's easily available at any garden store. So I just buy it by the bag. I fill it up, smooth it off, and then I take another tray insert and use that to compact the soil lightly. Okay. Smooth it off, and before I start, I like to water the soil so it is good and wet before I begin. Just a heads up, that's a good way to do it actually, is to water the soil before you plant the seeds so that you won't dislodge any of the seeds uh, that you're trying to plant, so. You can start seeds in a solid flat, but I like to use these compartmentalized dividers, so I find it easier to separate my plants. Plus I can leave them in the pot longer this way. I've chosen basil to, to sow today. Basil is probably the easiest herb to grow. One thing to remember, it cannot tolerate any cold. Don't put it outside until after nighttime temperatures are reliably above 40 degrees. Even warmer is better. These seeds are tiny. I find it easy to use the pinch method and I sprinkle just two or three seeds in each little compartment. It helps if you have dry hands. These stick <laughs> to my hands. After you have them sown, take a little bit of dry soil and just very lightly cover them. Many seeds need light to germinate and they won't germinate if they're buried too deep in the soil. After sowing the seeds, I'm not going to use the watering can again right now because these seeds are so delicate, I don't want to dislodge them or wa wash them away. So I'm just going to use a spray bottle to dampen them down. You can then put the tray in a warm, well-lit area. If you like, tent it with plastic. That helps raise the humidity and keep the temperature up until you start to see the little green sprouts coming up and then move it to an even uh, brighter spot 
rotating it from time to time to keep the little shoots from reaching for the light. You want to rotate it so they're well balanced all around. Once they have two or three sets of leaves, you can set the tray outside in a shady warm area during the daytime and bring it in at night uh, to harden the plants off. Once they've had that regimen for about three to four days, you're ready to pop them out of the tray and plant them in your garden. If you're planting many different herb seeds for your home garden, I would just use one tray. Plant basil, parsley, thyme in each little separate compartment. You won't need a whole package of seeds for each herb. Share with the neighbors. I'm Donna Emery from Glover Nursery in West Jordan, Utah, and we've been gardening with seeds for a home herb garden. All right, um, so that's Donna Emery from Utah. And a um, couple of things about that. Um, of all the herb seeds, first of all, basil is not the smallest seed. There are seeds that are far smaller. And of all the herbs, basil is the only one that is the, is the most heat lover of any of the, of the herbs. So as you know, as I said, the dill and the uh, cilantro are, love the, the cooler weather. Well, basil loves the, the warm weather. And, you know, she was, that's, that's what she was starting. Um, and, you know, I, I, I encourage people to grow, you know, that you can certainly grow herbs indoors if you want. You don't have to harden them off and bring them outside to your garden. You can certainly grow them indoors. And when you do that, the only one you really have to be careful about leaving it by the window in case a cool you know, the cool air comes in is your, is your basil because it's so, so finicky to the cold. So let's talk about uh, herb propagation from cuttings. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not immune to making, a, making an extra buck. And in, this, and in this age where the prices are going through the roof, trust me, that's not a political statement, uh, but you know, food's really expensive. And if you have herbs around and you can actually make an extra buck uh, taking propagating cuttings, it's not a bad way to do it. However, uh, typically you take cuttings from a plant uh, towards the end of the season. If you have a place that you can store them that won't freeze uh, and you can certainly replant them or you can sell them in, in the spring. So, but it's a seasonal thing. You're not going to be able to, you know, next month go out and take cuttings of your mint plant and, uh, you know, because they, they just won't be viable. They won't be ready. It, it takes a long time after you propagate it. you got to make sure the root set and it can, it can take months. You'll see I have a little video on that as well. So take uh, her herb propagation from cuttings. Take a cutting from the herb plant using a clean set of clippers or pruners. And when I say clean, I mean, you can, you can definitely transfer uh, bacteria from, from one plant to another. Uh, so what you need to do is you need to clean them off each time you use them with a little bit of rubbing alcohol. And don't, you know, don't be afraid to do that. Uh, when the plants are healthy and growing steadily, avoid cuttings on plants that are already flowering. Plants don't multitask well. And if you take a cutting and expect it to, to actually root, you know, in a place that it's, you know, in, an, in a new place and it's in the middle of flowering, it will get confused and it will probably die. Because like I say, they don't multitask well. Focus on the cuttings from the new growth because it's a lighter color um, and from plants that have not been over fertilized. Uh, thoroughly water to ensure the cuttings take. When you cut the stem, remove all the side shoots and the leaves from approximately the lower two thirds of the stem. Stripping the stem creates a wound at each node, which exposes more tissue and encourages the rooting. So wherever you, you'll see this gentleman do it. And wherever he removes the leaf, uh, creates that wound and that's where the roots grow from. Removing this uh, leaves and stems also helps to prevent the root rot. 
Shake a small amount of rooting compound onto a paper plate. Dip the lower part of the stem into the compound and lightly shake off the excess. Now, this, this, um, this assumes that you use the powdered rooting compound. There's also a gel compound as well. Either way, make sure when you purchase this rooting, some people use honey, by the way. So you can feel free to play around with that as well. But when you do use the rooting compound, understand that it expires after a while. So if you have, if you're like me, you know, you tend to keep your fertilizer. Fertilizer is good until you use it. Uh, but the rooting compound does have an expiration date on it. So poke holes in your soil, insert your seedlings, ensure they don't touch the bottom of the pot. Provide moisture and indirect sunlight very indirect, northern facing. In two to three weeks, you can transplant outdoors if required. Remember to water daily and fertilize every three weeks. Here is, uh, here is a, a video on growing the new herbs. Hello there. Who doesn't like getting something for nothing? Well, when you propagate herbs from cuttings, that's exactly what you'll get. Strong, healthy plants for free. In this video, we'll show you how easy it is to take cuttings from the most popular herbs so you can grow new plants with confidence. Late summer is the perfect time of year to take semi-ripe cuttings of herbs such as lavender, rosemary, sage and thyme. Semi-ripe cuttings are taken from this season's growth from stems that are beginning to harden up or ripen before winter. The base of the cutting should be slightly woody, while the tip of the cuttings will still be soft and unripened. Take cuttings from healthy, non-flowering, pest and disease-free growth. Cut them in the morning when temperatures are cooler and the cuttings are less likely to wilt. Use a sharp pair of clean pruners, then place the cuttings into a plastic bag to stop them drying out. If you can't prepare the cuttings immediately, Keep them in the refrigerator for up to 12 hours until you're ready to do so. Most cuttings should be about 4 to 6 inches or 10 to 15 centimetres long. Clean cut just below a leaf joint like this. Cut off the lowest leaves so only about 3 or 4 remain. Dip the end of the cuttings into organic hormone rooting powder or gel to improve the chances of success. Cuttings need very free draining potting soil, so mix potting soil with equal parts sharp sand. Or try a mix consisting of one third sterilised topsoil, one third leaf mould and one third sharp sand. Fill plastic pots with your cuttings mix. Now carefully insert the cuttings up to the first set of leaves and firm them in. Label the pot, water well and leave to drain. I just want to comment on this. This gentleman is from England, as you can probably tell. You can use potting soil. Basically, we use potting soil here. Not garden soil, not compost, but a decent potting soil. And the reason why we use it is because potting soil is light and airy, and it will give these cuttings the opportunity, the roots, an opportunity to spread freely. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to stop them from growing up right now. You're trying to concentrate on have them root. So uh, that's why I would use a, a, a potting soil. Typically, if you're growing anything to eat and you're, and you're going to do what we do and, and you know, put your heart and soul into your garden, you'd probably want to, um, to use organic potting soil. They have it anywhere. And if you don't want to, and if you want a recipe for organic potting soil, send me an email and, um, and I can include it in there. So uh, it's not that hard to make. Anyway, you can place about three cuttings into a pot this size or insert one cutting per cell of a plug tray like this. Cuttings will root quicker in a warm, humid place. A greenhouse or cold frame is ideal. Shade them from hot sun and keep the cuttings mix moist. Just one other Ins thing. When we talk about shade them from sun, definitely don't put them in direct sunlight. Because what that's going to do, that's going to trigger them. They're going to say, oh, the sun, I have to go towards the sun. And they're going to try to grow uh, up top. They're going to try to produce more leaf. And in doing so, they're going to not produce the root. And this is what we're trying to do is establish root. So you definitely have to keep them in some place that's 
uh, it's light, but not certainly not direct sunlight. So, uh. sure, good ventilation in hot weather. If you don't have a greenhouse or cold frame, you can cover pots with clear plastic bags secured in place with rubber bands to help raise the humidity. Place the pots on a bright window sill, but out of direct sunlight to prevent them overheating. Cuttings may root within about six to eight weeks, but can take up to four months. Unless they suddenly put on lots of growth, leave the cuttings where they are until spring. The rooted cuttings may then be potted on. To pot your cuttings on, remove them from their pot, then carefully tease them apart, keeping as much of the root system intact as possible. Plant them up into individual pots of fresh potting soil, then grow them on to plant outside a few weeks later. With very little effort, you'll quickly be able to produce many new herb plants, ideal for borders, containers, and for fresh tastes in the kitchen. They can even be trimmed up to make beautiful gifts, and all for free. Taking cuttings, then successfully growing them into mature plants, is deeply satisfying. If you've taken cuttings like this before, let us know how you got on by dropping us a comment below. And for more advice... Okay, um, there's something for nothing, folks. You know, definitely. And not all plants take that long to the whole season play around each plant you know it, it, it's difficult because like i say i'm a how-to type of person but each plant has a different life cycle um and you know experiment play around that's the way gardeners become good gardeners is by by playing around so so here's some herb garden ideas um first of all this is a simple old palette every once in a while you come by when you have something delivered or what have you and then and uh, so this is a, a simple uh, wooden palette idea. Over here, this is a really kind of a pretty one. Uh, it wouldn't take much, uh, a little bit of time, but it really would, doesn't take much uh, expertise to, to, to build something like that. Um, all you need to do is, uh, you know, have a little bit of wood and a, 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 a screw gun and, uh, you know, put that together. Um, so it's not that much of a big deal. The benefit of something like this is that uh, you give all the plants an opportunity to get the sunlight. Obviously, when you when you uh, uh, plant in something like this, you will make sure that the smaller plants are down bottom, and then the medium plants, and then the taller plants are up on top, so that everything has the opportunity to to get the sun. Because because you know the herbs herbs uh, tip have a tendency to like the sun. Down here, you'll see uh, that uh, here's a uh, just a mix. What I have done uh, for clients is, first of all, uh, I use resin pots because uh, the terracotta pots and ceramic pots tend to dry out too much. And I use the resin pots, they're very inexpensive. And what I do is, um, you know, I'll put some good, decent potting soil in there. And I plant all my perennial plants in one container and all my uh, annual plants in another container. So that in the fall, uh, the perennial plants can be taken indoors for use. And the annual plants, you can just dump out and get ready to start again next year. So that's the way I typically do it. And here's a nice, uh, a nice use of vertical gardening. Uh, you can certainly do that. And the benefit of herbs is that typically they don't need a deep pot to, to grow in. Four, five, six inches is plenty for most herbs. The, the deeper, the better, obviously, because you don't have to change out the soil and, you know, so, so often. And, uh, you know, they tend to like it, but you know, it's certainly not a requirement. And this is a good good use of vertical space. So let's talk about herbs deterring, uh, uh, deterring pests. And this is more reference material. This is why I, I want to make sure everybody has my uh, email address so that I can send you this presentation. Uh, basil repels flies, including mosquitoes and carrot fly. Uh, chamomile repels uh, repels a plethora of flying insects. 
chives repels carrot fly, Japanese beetles and aphids, dill, aphids, squash bugs, spider mites, cabbage, lob, lo, looper, and small white. Uh, and I know leek, somebody told me in one of my presentations, leek is not an herb. So, but in any case, it does do the, the carrot fly as well. Uh, you see the carrot fly for the leek and carrot fly for the chives, both in the onion family, both allium. So they have similar uh, 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 properties. Anything with lemon in it, lemon in it or lime, you see they repel mosquitoes because they all have that citronella chemical in it. Um, oregano is wonderful to deter many pests. Uh, you see peppermint, rosemary, spearmint. So grow a whole bunch of herbs and, and you'll, you'll get the best benefit. But believe me, if you have an infestation, if you have an infestation, it's too late. You've got to use some kind of an organic uh, pesticide approach. There's a lot of them. I have a presentation called the organic approach. This is all uh, uh, preventative maintenance. You grow a whole bunch of herbs. They taste good. They don't take up much space. You can leave them in containers and grow them right out uh, near your raised bed or near your, your garden uh, to deter the pests. So, okay. So that's reference material. So do we have any questions um, for me in the chat? I can read them. There we go. Yeah, I don't see, um, there are a couple. The one was from Kathy. Kathy would like to know, what are the top five hardiest perennial herbs? Oh my goodness, there are so many chives, um, mint, lemon balm, I'd say oregano, uh, sage, they're all very, very hardy. The whole thing is with those herbs, like I say, sometimes they're hard to start up. Give, have a little bit of patience. If, if I, I start everything from seed, you know, I'm an experienced gardener. Um, if you don't have the facilities to start them from seed, go buy a plant. Obviously, I, I prefer, you know, you, you get it from a reliable source, but, uh, but they'll be your best friends for many years to come. So And then um, Peter Mayer wanted to know what kind of wood is best for planters? Can pressure treated wood be used? Um, that's a good question. Uh, pressure treated wood, you know, we, we gardeners are fairly frugal people and uh, we like to use what's around. If there's a pressure treated wood that was used in the, that was, uh, you know, reclaimed from the 1980s or what have you, or, or sooner, um, that may contain arsenic. So, um, and that can be taken up by your plants. So it's determined not to use old reclaimed pressure treated wood in your garden. However, if you use currently manufactured pressure treated wood, the USDA has determined that that is safe. However, it is treated with copper and copper is a natural uh, uh, anti antiseptic uh, plant, uh, antifungal. So you can use it, but your garden will, will not be considered uh, to be uh, organic because mm -hmm. it does have an impact, a positive one. It does have a chemical impact on your plants, but it is considered safe. I don't mean to be confusing. Yes, you can use it, but your plants will not be considered to be uh, organic by the uh, USDA standards because it, contain, it contains copper, so. Um, what effect does copper have on your health, if anything? If, um, um, I, don't think, I don't think it has any effect on your health at all, so they say, um, but that's, yeah, I don't think the copper has any effect at all. I, you know, I don't use it because I sell plants to people. And yeah. um, so, you know, and I have to, I have to sell organic. So um, I would use it for that reason. I don't know if they know, you know, the effects, but I wouldn't think it would have much of an effect. So the USDA says it doesn't. I'm not a doctor. So I would have to go by what they say. So. Yeah, we have to look at the percentages. Right, um, there you go. What, um, let's see, there was another one. Um, what herbs 
Oh yeah, you have a whole presentation on this, but um, maybe you could give us like just a brief overview of what herbs are best to repel groundhogs and other rodents. I don't, so first of all, groundhogs and rodents are an, another issue altogether. I've had a lot of, lot of clients that have issues with, with uh, rodents. Um, and if they live on the premises, um, they're gonna eat what's around. And if you're gonna to try to repel them with herbs and they're used to that smell and you're gonna to try to deter them, it's, it's not gonna to matter to them because they'll find, I, I have, I, I've had so many gardens that have been destroyed. Why? Because you have a family of groundhogs that's living right under the shed. That's their backyard. They're gonna eat there. You have to employ whirly gigs. There are stakes that you can stick in the ground that have a vibrating, it's solar, solar powered, vibrating uh, stakes. They, and and that, that kind of scares them away for a while. You know, you have to, underneath where the garden is, you, they put, land, there's a, a certain metal uh, uh, fabric, a metal cloth that you put in. It's a very expensive process. Um, you know, it, if they can't get in underneath, they can climb up three or four feet. So you have to put some fencing around. So it can be, uh, it can be an ordeal. Um, you can use, you can try scarecrows. There's a product out there called uh, Animal Be Gone. Uh, there's there's uh, carnivore urine that you can purchase and that you can use um, that, that deters them, you know, whether it's fox urine or, you know, their natural predators, coyote urine. I have no idea how they harvest it, but they do. So, um, <laughs> and I don't know, I think it's actually really, they say it's really fox urine or what have you. It may be your best bet. Um, of course, the really the best bet is to, to, to put a uh, what they call hardware cloth completely on the bottom of your garden, then put the soil on top and then put your garden on top. But that's not always practical for people. If you are going to put a fence around, it should be buried a whole foot under the ground, which is also a real effort if you have a rocky soil like typically we do in Massachusetts. So uh, send me an email. I can give you more, more information on it, on the, uh, on the groundhogs. So. Okay. Um, and does it, does it work to put cat, like your, your cats, um, if you have a cat box, does it work to spill your cats? Um, your, your, or your litter box? Um, yeah. No. I mean, yes, it may. Um, if the cat, is, if the, it's a little mole or something that's a, uh, that the cat is a, a natural uh, uh, predator. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, if you put it too close, that is actually uh, carnivore feces. The feces of the, the cat or, or the dog are actually, uh, they have a bacteria that's not good for your garden. Oh, you yeah. You can try it. Yeah, you can try it. But, um, and I think it probably would for the most part, but if it's too near your garden, it, it, you may have an effect that, that you don't want to have because it's, you know, you, you can't compost uh, carnivore uh, feces for that, for that reason, so. No, that's true. Um, Susan wanted to know what herbs deter loads of ants in the spring? Oh my goodness. Well, let me see, hold on a second. Um, let's see if we can see one. Uh, looking for ants. Ants, spearmint, there you go. Spearmint is nice. I mean, you can buy the plant. It took me a couple of tries and um, to, to actually grow it from seed, but um, you can certainly grow it. Let's see if I have anything here for ants. Ants, catnip. Ooh, Easy. catnip, good one, okay. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay. Excellent. Spearmint and catnip. There you go. What else we got? Anything? I think that's it. Um, that's all the questions we have tonight uh, or today. I'm sorry. I keep saying tonight because we usually have programs at night. I know. <laughs> so, okay. So, so just, just to let you know, I know this is being recorded, but I also have the PowerPoint presentation as part of the package. I send it to anyone who asked me for it. 
Plus, I am a world wealth of information. Trust me, a lot of it I get because I, I ask, I read, I have a lot of great resources at my disposal. I'm also the, uh, I'm also the uh, president of a garden club and I have some great gardeners uh, that work for me in you know, the Facebook group with well, you know, close to 70,000 people. You know, I've got authors and bloggers and, you know, all kinds of, uh, anyway, I can, I can find any information for you. So uh, please take down this, uh, this email, bvveggiegardens at gmail.com. Or you can also contact me using my, uh, my website, because there's a contact us form on there. And with any question you have, I'll gladly get back to you. So any other questions? Not right now, but um, right. I'm sure, but I really appreciate you sharing your contact information and I'm sure people will be reaching out to you. And if nothing else, you'll be back with us in April. And yeah. I'm really excited for that presentation too. Yeah, thank you. And I'll send you the presentation as well if you, if you want it. I'll send you the recording. Uh, we have- Great, there you go. One, so perfect. Okay, thank, thank you, so thank you very much. Have a good one. Have a good evening, afternoon, whatever. Enjoy bye the bye. rest of your weekend. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.